Hello and welcome to the Nexus. Today's show, the Ayatollah. Ali Khamenei has ruled Iran for nearly 30 years. But has the time now come for change? We're going to be focusing on three things. What do the recent protests reveal about the Ayatollah's enemies? And could they one day be strong enough to change the regime? Newly leaked video reveals just how much Khamenei himself pleaded with his fellow clerics not to make him leader. And living in America, CEOs, tech giants, math geniuses, why do Iranians do so well in the land of the great Satan? All that ahead here in the Nexus. Hello, I'm Matthew Moore, and today in the Nexus, we are looking at Iran's supreme leader, the Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. Well, to help us, we've invited three guests. We have the human rights activist, Mariam Nayab Yazdi, the Iranian blogger, Potkin Azamer, and we also have the editor-in-chief of Radio Fada, Nusha Bograti. So, now we are all gathered, let's take a look at our first report, and the Ayatollah and his enemies. You know, how many مداران عالم و مستکبران عالم به خصوص شیطان بزرگ رو امریکا بدانند ملت ایران به هیچ قدرتی باج نکنند Iran remains one of the most dangerous threats to the United States Iran's cruel regime wastes tens of billions of dollars spreading me He has money, he has guns, he has information, and he has the keys to the prison. He controls media, he controls judiciary, he controls police, and he has his own economic empire. The hardcore of the system is revolutionary guard. These people control the military security bodies of the country, but also foreign policy, uh, a, a great part of the Iranian politics, and even economy. He became a powerful leader only because he was commander in chief of armed forces. Since 2009, he was uh, more comfortable in suppressing the democratic movement in Iran. In recent days, we have watched widespread protests erupt in many Iranian cities. Feel some shame. Let go of the country. Those are the words of the brave people of Iran. What does the president see as the end game in Iran? Does he like, would he like to see regime change? I think the ultimate end game would be that the citizens and the people of Iran are actually given basic human rights. Ayatollah Khamenei believes that the West and its allies never recognized the Islamic Republic since 1979. دشمن منتظر یک فرصت منتظر یک رخنه است که از این رخنه وارد بشه the legacy of ayatollah khamenei would be creating a protection for the survival of the regime interesting times in Iran. Let's get the opinion of our panel now. Nusha Bograti, if I could start with you. So many things to discuss, but let's start with the Ayatollah's accusation that it's the foreign powers that are behind these protests. Well, uh, I have to say that's absolutely ridiculous. If there is one person to blame or one block to blame, it's the block of the supreme leader because the uh, most uh, realistic theory as if as, as to how the whole process started inside the country, uh, it was staged by most probably, or not sure this is not fact, but this is an analysis which is very close to reality. It, it has started in the religious city of uh, Mashhad and some other uh, religious cities, eastern cities, 
against President Rouhani, against the uh, policies of President Rouhani. We, we heard um, slogans being chanted, such as death to Rouhani. And it was said by Rouhani himself and you know people close to him, like his vice president, uh, that it was staged by the imam of uh, Mashhad so that right. uh, they could put pressure on Rouhani. So actually uh, what you're saying is the, the, the hardliners in the regime started this in order to put pressure on the so-called moderates, Rouhani, and it actually got out of control, and these are the unintended consequences. Let's take a look at the map then. Uh, we have them all, the protests all mapped out here, and we're going to zoom in on Iran, and you'll see there various cities, including, uh, let's see, we have Rasht, Mashhad, which is where you said they started, uh, the holy city of Rom, uh, Esfahan. Uh, Potkin, if I can come back to you just uh, for a moment. What uh, Nusha is saying is that it was started by the hardliners in Mashhad to put pressure on Rouhani. I don't think you quite agree with that analysis, do you? Not at all. I mean, Nusha is a, is a reformist, is, a, and is pro Rouhani, and uh, I didn't expect him to say otherwise. Uh, this notion that the hardliners started this is absolute nonsense. Yeah. I mean, he only, Nusha only mentions the death to Rouhani chants. Uh, did he not hear any death to Khamenei chants? Did he not hear any death to dictatorship chants? Did he not hear any uh, chants that were against the whole establishment of the Islamic Republic? Even if what he says is true, that this was some sort of protest in Mashhad that started by the hardliners um, against Rouhani, it's gone completely out of their control now. So it's completely irrelevant now, because like within that um, protest in Mashhad, they chanted uh, against the establishment, they chanted in favor of Reza Shah, the man who modernized Iran, the man who uh, uh, pushed back the, uh, the, uh, the clerics back into the mosques and curtailed their, 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 their power. Uh, people were pining for a pre-1979 Iran. This is not something that you'd expect well, the hard... So, so, uh, Nusha, just quickly, a right of reply, just quickly. Well, yeah, first of all, I'm not a reformist, uh, but the, the thing is that I do agree with what Potkin said about the, the protests getting out of hand. And as I said, this is not fact that it was started by uh, blocks, hardliners uh, close to Khamenei, but I said it's the analysis which could be close to reality. Uh, Mariam, do you have any sympathy with the, uh, the Ayatollah's uh, accusations that foreign powers are behind this? Well, uh, of course, I also think it's ridiculous. Uh, I think uh, going back to what they were just talking about, um, I, from, from the analysis that we have seen and from the evidence that we have seen, uh, it is likely that uh, Rouhani's political rivals did instigate uh, the initial protests. But as Potkin said, um, you know, once the people are out into the streets, uh, you really can't control the okay. narrative of the protests. Okay, fair enough. Uh, let's, let's just have a look at one bit of interference. There was certainly uh, people cheering from the sidelines. Uh, Donald Trump, for example, his tweet, he says, you know, they're hungry for food, for freedom. Along with human rights, the wealth of Iran is being looted. Time for change. Potkin, do you think that Trump didn't stir things up at first, but he's lending support, clearly. Anyone's entitled to uh, uh, say something in solidarity uh, and express their opinion. Um, obviously, I don't wish for any military interference. I don't wish for any financial support. Um, but um, I think it's just a natural thing, and it's most welcome for people to express solidarity. With the Is it welcome? Because some, some commentators are saying actually having Trump speak out for the Iranians on the streets just gives credence to the Ayatollah and the regime's uh, uh, criticism that this is being stirred up by the outside. Well, compare it with 2009 when Obama didn't say anything and they still use the same excuse. So whether they express their um, support or not, the Iranian regime is always going to blame it on the enemies. But, mm. I mean, let's, let's just be factual about this. I mean, I actually wrote an article uh, about a week before the protest started predicting something is about to happen in Iran because um, I do an investigative program uh, about the uh, issues in Iran, and I was I was following closely what was happening. You had groups of uh, people who'd uh, lost their savings in these quasi banks that are connected to the IRGC that were protesting on the streets. You had people who were fed up with the um, uh, environmental disaster that Iran is becoming, the the air pollution who were protesting. You had uh, um, pensioners who were protesting about their dwindling pensions, about the pension companies that were going bankrupt. You had women protesting about not being able to go to the stadiums. You had uh, uh, relatives. Uh, you had all sorts of different protest groups. None of these were issues that were created by the outsiders, by America right, or by Israel. Right. Actually, you say it's, it's not created by the outsiders, but uh, some would argue their sanctions have made life very tough for Iranians. But we'll leave that aside. Um, let's 
let's bring up a graphic now of the economy. A few key points. Inflation running at over 10%. Youth unemployment at over 20%. And, of course, uh, the corruption. You know, it's one of the, the worst countries in the world for corruption. Uh, corruption 131st out of 176. I mean, there are some genuine grievances there, Pock. And do you think that the people are looking at Rouhani or the Supreme Leader uh, when they want to blame someone for this? They're looking at the whole establishment. And the chants have been against the whole establishment. The chance haven't been for softliners or for hardliners, for this faction or that faction, like it was in 2009. The chance this time has been directly against the clerics. People are yeah. fed up. But it's the only country where it's ruled by priests and clerics. Nowhere else is like this. I don't understand why people find it difficult to understand that people don't want to be ruled by clerics anymore. Actually, Parkin, um, uh, to, to your point, we've got some video here of, of protesters tearing down the portraits of the Ayatollah Khamenei. This must be a very brave thing to do in Iran. Uh, we can see in a moment, it's quite a grainy bit of footage taken perhaps by a, a camera phone, but there they are pulling it down. That must be a very, very brave thing to do in Iran. Well, that's why I think the theory is that this, these, were, these protests were organized by hardliners. It's ridiculous. You really think the uh, hardliners would get the protesters to burn down the uh, Ayatollah Khamenei's uh, posters? Never. Mariam, I want to come back to you briefly. You're a human rights activist. We're hearing that people are dying in prisons. Protesters have been arrested and they are now being tortured and dying. Is that what you're hearing? Uh, we, have, uh, we have reports of uh, two prisoners who have died under custody in prison, uh, in two separate prisons, one a detention centre in Iraq and one in Tehran Zavin prison. Um, so far, there's been two deaths. Um, probably related, uh, they're probably protesters who were arrested. And uh, the Iranian authorities themselves have announced over 3,000 arrests. Uh, human rights groups, uh, I work closely with uh, human rights activists in Iran, HRAI. They're uh, probably the, 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 the human rights group who covered the protests the most extensively. And they so far have about 420 names of uh, protesters confirmed that were arrested. Uh, but again, the Iranian authorities themselves have um, have claimed uh, more than 3,000 arrests. Mariam, thank you for the update. Now, uh, we are going to look at some newly leaked video which has shocked many Iranians or confirmed their suspicions in some cases. It's from 1989 and shows Khamenei pleading with the assembly of experts not to elect him as leader. We should shed tears of blood wailing for the Islamic society that has been forced to even propose me. In everyone's eyes, I'm not even qualified to take this position. In the eyes of the Islamic law, I'm not even qualified to be considered for the role. Well, let's take a look at this now with Nusha. Uh, Nusha, there was a, always a small clip from that Assembly of Experts gathering, but this is much more, and it's quite revealing. Uh, what do you make of the clip first, and then tell me what you make of the timing and who might be behind this leak? Well, that, 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 that would be a complete speculation. We, we would not be sure who can be behind the leak of the video. It was... Who, sta who stands to gain from it? Let's put it that way. Uh, well, you know, I can tell you who would be harmed by it. Right. I, for sure, Ayatollah Khamenei, the Supreme Leader of Iran, will be uh, harmed hugely by this video. But on the other hand, uh, Hashemi Rafsanjani, who was the head of the Assembly of Experts at that time, also uh, who, who passed away a couple of uh, years back, will be uh, hugely damaged because we we can see through that video that how the whole thing was orchestrated by Akbar Hashemi Rafsanjani in order to make uh, the supreme the Khamenei the supreme leader of Iran something which was uh, even by the Constitution of Iran. Uh, at that time, it was unconstitutional. Uh, so it, it, uh, on both okay. sides, okay. it's, um, you know, making some damage to both the Supreme Leader and, sure. uh, uh, and Raf Sanjan. One very important thing there not to forget is that he was uh, selected as a interim uh, leader. Yes, exactly. Uh, That's the point. How did he manage to stay on for, what, uh, getting on for 29 years now when he was actually just supposed to be a caretaker? Well, that's the thing. I, I think this this was something which was orchestrated, as I said, uh, by Hashemi Rafsanjani, who at that time was very close to the Supreme Leader. Then the, the rift started be between them. 
but um, yeah, I, I think I think that this was some strategy that they were working on, right? Uh, because Khamenei might not had the uh, had enough legitimacy at that, that time to become a uh, supreme. Well, that's what he said himself. Supreme. Yeah. Let, let's quickly jump yeah. back to Potkin. Potkin, when when you saw this video for the first time after all these years, what was your reaction? I was really surprised, actually, because um, there had been another version of this video where he just comes down sort of like basically expresses humility. Uh, no one knew that this one existed uh, um, as well. Um, I mean, I don't want to speculate either about how this video got that, but um, some of the important things, I mean, one of them, uh, Nusha mentioned the fact that uh, it seemed like this was going to be an interim position. There's also another thing that came out of this video where Khamenei actually says himself that he doesn't have the necessary um, uh, clerical rank yes. in that position. He raises a technical issue with the constitution, saying that you know I'm not, uh, uh, in terms of clerical ranks, I'm not high enough to be able to to take up this position. And then he addresses uh, one of the grand ayatollahs. He says, like for example, if I issue a command uh, tomorrow, would you, who higher yes. than me in terms of clerical ranking, would you accept that order? Now this all just goes to show that how shrewd Khamenei is as a politician. I mean, you may be against him, but I think you have to admit that as a politician, he's a very shrewd politician. I think after Khamenei's death, Raf Sanjani was of the opinion that the um, position of the supreme leader would be more of a ceremonial uh, 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 position. Uh, he wouldn't really have such executive powers, and it'd be the president who would be there. And so, so he put him as the president, and he, and he, and he promoted Khamenei to be the uh, supreme leader. But Khamenei is so shrewd that he adds box and at maneuvers. Ah, rap. okay. That is something really interesting. Okay, so, Potkin, thank you. Thank you for that. We are going to uh, move on a little bit now. And as Ayatollah Khamenei's title suggests, he is the supreme leader. But that's not to say he has all the power. The regime is a complex setup, which we're going to try to explain in 90 seconds, if you can spare the time. There have been many attempts to explain Iran's power structure, and they all look incredibly complicated. Here we go again, then. Some say Iran is both a theocracy and a democracy, with elected institutions and unelected ones. On paper, all power leads back to the people who elect the president and the assembly of experts who elect the supreme leader. But in reality, it's the regime, not the people, in control. Yes, people get a vote, but always from a range of candidates selected by the regime. Not a real choice. Who's in charge is somewhat debatable, but here's what most experts say. In first place, of course, the Supreme Leader. Then the Revolutionary Guard, followed by the Guardian Council, the President, and finally the National Security Council. The Supreme Leader is the Commander-in-Chief of all the armed forces, including the Revolutionary Guard, which has about 125,000 military personnel. The elite Al-Quds force operates abroad, Syria, Iraq, Lebanon. The Besiji stay at home, acting as morality police and putting down protests. Some estimate the Revolutionary Guard controls a third of Iran's economy, and may be more powerful than even the clerics. The Supreme Leader also controls the Guardian Council, appointing half of its members and appointing the head of the judiciary, who appoints the other half. The Guardian Council decides who can run for president. The Supreme Leader oversees the president and has the power to dismiss him. Although the president officially chairs the National Security Council, it almost never acts against the wishes of, you guessed it, the Supreme Leader. So, in one way or another, all roads from the different power centres lead back to the Ayatollah. So is that all clear now? Let's go to Nusha. Nusha, they do this on purpose, right? They make it complicated and they spread the oh, power absolutely. around. Yes, absolutely. This, uh, it's, it's the kind of system, the mechanism that they have created in order to give the impression of having a uh, sort of a democracy inside Iran. Uh, of course, everybody knows that it's a mock-up of the democracy when you can only choose, as uh, your piece was just mentioning, uh, you can choose from a uh, circle of chosen few. Uh, so they, they make it complicated, that they, they make all these inner circles in order to uh, give the impression of, of that kind of, you know, sophisticated system. But uh, I, I don't believe that it's that much sophisticated to tell you the truth it's it's a monarchy it's sort of a islamic religious caliphate if you might say because uh, at the end of the day the supreme leader has all the power and that makes uh, the the comprehension of the whole system much easier yes there's president yes he's elected from a few people of course the result of the election can always be tampered with because 
the highest uh, power that actually blesses the uh, result of the election mm. is the Guardian Council, which is again elected and selected by the Supreme Leader. So yes. everything uh, at, at the end goes to one person. And uh, th th this makes understanding the whole system, Potkin. I think, a little bit more easy. Let's quickly go over to Potkin. Potkin, uh, it's a, a naive question, perhaps, but what does this Supreme Leader think of the current President Rouhani? Uh, as you said, the, the, the candidates are selected by the, uh, by the Guardian Council. And you can see with the quality of candidates they put up against Rouhani, whether they really wanted Rouhani to win or not. The quality of the candidates that were selected to stand up uh, uh, against Rouhani was so bad that it was obvious. Okay, I just want to bring in um, a, a previous president, uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. We have some pictures of him. He said that the judiciary is actually the real dictatorship, more powerful than the Ayatollah even, and he's having a big fight with them at the moment. Marion, what do you think of that? Do you, the, the, do you think that's a ridiculous charge and that the Supreme Leader is you know, by far and away the most powerful figure in the country? Well, I don't want to comment on Ahmadinejad, but uh, the judiciary is supposed to be independent in Iran, and it's not. Mm. Um, you know, Khamenei it does have the ultimate power in Iran. Uh, however, the real powerhouse in Iran is the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, which is under Rouhani anyway. Uh, sorry, under Khamenei anyways. But they are the real power in Iran. Um, they're quite corrupt, and they control majority of Iran's economy. Mm. Um, so th that's where we should be looking. And yes, the judiciary is very corrupt. So within the judiciary, there's uh, some judges uh, who are basically doing uh, the, the, the bidding of the IRGC and Khamenei. So okay. that's, they're the ones really uh, sentencing the prisoners of conscience to death or giving them uh, heavy prison sentences. And uh, a lot of the protesters that were arrested post-2009 uh, in Iran uh, have been sentenced to death or given heavy prison, prison sentences from these corrupt judges. Um, there's about, like I think, six of them that have been really identified. Well, while Iran's economy is struggling, many Iranians living in the land of the great Satan, which most people call America, are thriving. It seems a little bit of freedom goes a long way. Uh, I have to say the trip up here was not fun for me. I did suffer a lot. In nine months, the revenue was more than I was making at my day job. And that's kind of when the light bulb went off. Doing well in math is uh, not uncool. <laughs> what I'd like to do this morning is tell you um, a, a few attributes of uh, the uh, extended mission. This is an incredible brand and a terrific service. Let's find out why they're so successful now. Potkin, what is it about America, Iranians living in America? They do so well. well it's, not, it's not just America. Wherever Iranians have gone to, they've been one of the most successful communities. I mean, the yep. um, um, Iranian refugee or Iranian people who came as refugees to other countries, yes. they, in most countries have been, has been successful. And they could have been even more successful if there wasn't like different waves of uh, refugees. So sure. we've had like different waves that start from the beginning. And I've, seen, I've, I've read a number of reports on this, Potkin. They say that because Iranian Americans or wherever they might be, prize education so much, from that comes a success. Well, it, it, it just goes back to the system again. The system is crushing the talents of the Iranian people. Um, I mean, um, one of the chants that protesters were saying was that our graduates are unemployed whereas the clergy are uh, uh, running, uh, are, uh, have got the top jobs. That was one of the chants that they were seeing. So this is not a meritocracy where you're sort of like rewarded for your talents. You, um, this, is, this is a theocracy mixed in with uh, nepotism, with, uh, uh, you know, uh, you, you're rewarded with sort of like, you know, how religious you pretend to be, uh, um, not because of what you can really do. Um, you know, this is, this, is, this is the root cause of a lot of the problems in Iran, which is nothing to do with America or Israel. Mm. And it's this new experimental system of clergy running Iran 
okay. which, is failing, which is failing the Iranian talent as well. Quickly pop back to Mariam for the last word. Mariam, um, where do you think Iran would be if people had the sort of levels of freedom they enjoy elsewhere? Uh, there's a lot of untapped potential in Iran, um, you know, as we can see from uh, the talent outside of Iran. Uh, so the, I think that uh, Iranians can play a very key role um, uh, in the Middle East and uh, for stabilizing the region, actually. And um, I just think that uh, what they're lacking are basic freedoms. And uh, if they had that and they had uh, more of a free economy, mm. um, not so much uh, of the corruption. OK. Nisha Bograti. Potkin Azameh and Mariam Nayab Yazdi. Thank you all so much. Well, that is all for now. Uh, next week, it's a special anniversary. One year of either a very stable genius or some kind of man child in the White House. Either way, it's going to be tremendous. Thanks for watching. See you then.